Um, uh, it was, of course, a very different time. And I don't, some things maybe I don't have to say because uh, some has been said before me. The, the kind of work that women did at that time, huh? that they, were, they weren't only in the back lines, actually. The idea of the mother at home saying goodbye to her son or husband as he goes off to war, thinking, worrying every day about if some telegram is going to come, you know, telling her that someone has, has died. Also, the Red Cross, and even there were, of course, crimes committed against women, and women pulled into prostitution sometimes. And then there was this idea of Mary, mother, the religious symbol of this kind of men at the front line who were praying to Mary and who were, who were thinking about this mother figure and really needing this comfort of the mother. <coughs> I wanted to, I just chose one woman, um, Bertha von Suchner, I think probably many of you know, and uh, who, what I didn't understand about her was that she actually had lost two husbands to war. Uh, with some space in between, but she, before she became such an activist and spoke out so strongly, uh, she actually went through this terrible pain and trauma of having lost her husbands to war, and one of them was even in an accident during the war, so not even with the heroic feeling, you know, of having sacrificed, been sacrificed for his patriotic uh, efforts. And she wrote a book called Down With Arms, and uh, she, of course, she tried to describe the situation of how the soldiers felt at the time. Of course, the women were not there, but this some heroism and some patriotism and, and this camaraderie between the men and sacrifice among them, and that they were participating in history. Uh, but then there was the other side. There was the side of dying and killing and the rest of your life living with those memories of having killed someone or having, you know, having someone very close to you having died. It wasn't worth it. So she brought a lot of uh, understanding, I think, to the people of the time. She received some critique, but she also got the Nobel Peace Prize, also in part because her position in society. She was actually a countess. So now we fast forward to modern women taking on nation building and creating a new culture of peace. We live in a very, very different time. But I think nevertheless we can understand a lot from what, uh, how the women were 100 years ago and how they organized themselves and their passion. Uh, this is a picture from one of our Women's Federation events at the Houses of Parliament with again a few good men supporting, <laughs> including my husband. <laughs> So I, a few points I just want to touch is, so what is feminine peace leadership? So what are some of the goals for a sustainable peace culture and the work ahead? So what is our mission? We have to talk about education. What are our priorities? How can we create the kind of solidarity that the women, for instance, at the Red Cross, how they work together in a, really almost in a selfless kind of way for the sake of the, the cause? And how can we understand, too, we, we live in a time of danger. How can we rally ourselves to realize that there are there is an enemy, there are enemies in our society that really need to be uh, fought against? And how do we organize our advocacy? How do we influence policy and governance? So just a thought about peace. Peace is connecting and motivation, uh, leadership is being able to motivate people. The secret to successful peace leadership, first of all, we have to understand conflict. What is the nature of conflict? And then we have to have the capacity to bring out the goodness in even the enemy, in the people that are in conflict. I think as mothers, as women, as teachers, we discover those things. We discovered all those skills in our daily life. 
So this is, a, actually this was already mentioned, I don't need to read it because it was already said in the introduction, but this was at the founding, in one of the early events of the Women's Federation held at the United Nations with our founding president when she talked about reconciliation and the specific role of women in peace, that we have to solve problems and straighten out the direction of history by the feminine logic of love. Love does not mean weak and wishy-washy. Love is powerful. Love is strong. Love is, can be strict and disciplined, but is also embracing and compassionate. So this is a more recent event. This was just, I, I was surprised it was earlier this month, actually. Uh, we were there in Vienna. Where's the Vienna team? Could you just quickly stand up? This was the team that organized this event. Thank you very much. It wasn't really planned that way, but it was exactly in line with our theme today, sustainable peace through reconciliation and education. We had several governments co-sponsoring, governments speaking. It was a very, I would say a very great event, uh, where again we could bring together, we brought together educators, we brought together uh, people who are working in the legal side, we brought together the women heads of, NG the heads of NGOs, the people from nations like Eritrea and Ethiopia came together and talked about what does the future look like for their nations now that there is a peace agreement. And it was, I think, very, very good. Uh, we live at a time of the Sustainable Development Goals. How amazing, actually, that the, the, the heads of state unanimously got together and pledged to take steps now, as we embark, no, the, to free the human race from the tyranny of poverty and want and to heal our secure and secure our planet. So to work together for this. Of course, signing is one thing, but actually doing it is something else. And I think that's why, that is why we are doing what we are doing as women at different locations in society. We are the ones who have to really hold governments responsible we are the ones who cannot just think the government is going to do it. We have to talk about it, we have to educate about it, we have to think about it. In our, in our families, with our children, in our projects, in our communities. I think that is the great thing about civil society work. We have this capacity to work locally, but we have to really be sure that we're thinking globally, that we're thinking there is a huge framework in place already. We have to just put ourselves in and really see what we can do. Well, exactly, yeah. Who will do it? Those who know and love peace. That is what Women's Federation for World Peace, that is one of our key themes. So usually peacemakers, now I go into a little bit of a different area. Peacemakers are not created overnight, but should be raised from an early age. But those youth, and I think even some of the youth in the back there, who are some of them are children of the Women's Federation uh, leaders who are here today, who uh, see their parents doing good deeds and themselves want to do something similar. Um, yeah. 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 That in that way, the peace policy that the United Nations or the government is uh, creating um, should resonate more easily with young people who have, who have been raised with that kind of thinking and in that kind of environment. This is one of my more favorite quotes from Eleanor Roosevelt when she says, where, after all, do human, universal human rights begin? She brings it home. It has to begin at home. If it doesn't work at home, it's not going to work on the broader scale. So, so again, bringing back the, bringing the, the global to the local. Also, there's a Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 21, which is so important for us and for our work. We're talking about we have duties to our community, but not only that, it's not just like a burden. In fact, it is our liberation. Because as we recognize our importance to our community, we understand our own character and our own uh, best qualities and how our communities need us. 
and then, of course, ideally to pass that on. We say peace is freedom to see the needs of others and then to respond wisely and naturally, not because we're forced to or because it's a law. These are some pictures from some of our events in Geneva at the United Nations with UNICEF, and we had, uh, we had different, this was a Middle East peace conference we had. So I, won't, I don't need to say that. I would probably ask you, you probably know it by heart already because it's been repeated twice, but this is our mission statement <laughs> for the Women's Federation. So I think the difference now at this time is not, uh, is that based upon efforts that have been made at the grassroots level over many years, I mean, we can go back beyond 1919, but in Women's Federation since 1992, we have built up a, um, a set of successes that allow us to really be able to recognize why, it's not just theory, why women's involvement. You said it so well, talking about the Security Council Resolution 1325. Why are, is women's involvement so important? Now we're at a point where we can take that body of success and we have to go to the United Nations. We have to go to the governments and we have to really show them because their perspective is not necessarily the local one. So feminine leadership, feminine peace leadership is needed to balance and bring out the best of masculine peace leadership. Of course, I would love if we had 50% men and 50% women here. But anyway, we're grateful for the few good husbands who came to support their wives. <laughs> we have certain, I would say, qualities that we can maybe develop more easily than men or more naturally because of our roles and maybe our character. Things like reconciliation, creating cohesion, volunteerism, there are many, but not to say men don't have the same. It's not just because we are half of the population or a little bit more than half that we should be empowered. It is actually because it is critical that men and women, masculinity and femininity work together as we see in the family. It's important that there is a father and a mother in the family to help raise the children. Society is like a global family. So we have to go beyond the politics and the power struggle. We have to use uh, it's, uh, we, in Women's Federation, we look to the family pattern to guide politics and to guide good relations in the community. As women in wartime work together to protect family and innocence with passion, courage, and resolve, this is also needed now. Sometimes we are too complacent. Sometimes we don't feel this urgency, oh, it's maybe something nice to do, to go out and to, if, you, if we read something in the newspaper that really makes us upset or we see something in, the, in our communities that we feel needs to be changed, we have to become the kind of people who can organize themselves and do something about it. And you never know where that will lead, actually. I think many women in this room are doing things like that. So we have to be able to apply our knowledge, talents, experiences, and good feminine intuition to influence governance about priorities and to hold them accountable to their promises, including the Sustainable Development Goals, including Security Council Resolution 1325. So nature of peace is to grow from the bottom up. We often see it's kind of the peace treaty is signed and somehow everybody should be okay with each other. It, it doesn't work like that. It, of course, it has to go from both angles. Mothers and fathers give the first and strongest impression to their children's expectation about leadership and about peace and governance through the love that they learn. The dynamic between parents and children to care for the family and contribute to community together creates expectations about social norms and behaviors. This is the last slide. Um, peace culture. Our current day peace culture is also worth defending. We don't often see it like that. Dignity, the fabric of peace, has to come from purpose. 
Dignity is not just having enough food or having a home, a roof over your head. It comes with the way we relate to each other. It comes with my caring about others sometimes more than myself, or the family next door more than my own family. Human rights are immutable. Again, this is my opinion, and maybe most women's federation uh, leaders and members. Human rights are immutable mainly because they are sacred rights. Again, not just a good idea so that we can live together relatively in peace, but actually they come from somewhere, and it's the framework for making things work better. This is the place where men and women find their complementarity and fullness and learn to share our human responsibilities. So this is, actually this is my last one. Uh, peace leaders create culture that changes the world by moving the hearts of people. That is a quote from our founder uh, of the Women's Federation for World Peace, which I love because it's very different than our kind of normal thinking about peace and peace leadership and peace frameworks. It means we have to become the kind of people that people are moved by seeing what we are doing. Like at the time of World War I, the Red Cross. These women were heroines, and people were so amazed by the sacrifices they were making. I think the same is, is possible at this time in history. Thank you.